Hey everybody, welcome to this week's podcast. No special announcements or anything, so let's jump right into it. First up, Todd from RetroFrog and Todd's Nerd Cave has just released a 3D printed bracket that helps secure the receivers for the wireless Brawler 64 and Tribute 64 controllers. And while this is a very handy thing that you should probably pick up if you're concerned about wearing out the controller port, I don't think it should have ever been necessary, and obviously I'm not talking about Todd here. Um, it just It's odd to me that two separate companies each have wireless N64 controllers and wireless receivers that plug into the controller port that don't have strain relief. So just the re receivers themselves when they're flopping around in there it doesn't seem too bad, certainly not much more, if any, than an original controller. But once you plug your memory pack into it, then you're starting to anchor down the side and the insides of the pins on that controller port. And while I didn't do any extensive testing or anything like that, it certainly looks like it would wear down your controller port a lot faster. Whereas Todd just made a very simple bracket that this slides through that puts all of the pressure on whatever surface the N64 is sat on. So when the weight of the card goes in, it just sits on the table. It doesn't put the pressure on the inside of the controller ports. Now, maybe the way the controller ports are built and the weight of everything combined means that you will never wear them out and they will outlast every other component on the console and there's nothing to worry about. But if you've just done something like N64 digital modded your console and you know you have a, a rare console that you really love, would you really want to take the chance? Um, you know, for me personally, if I just had a couple stock ones laying around and I was only occasionally using it, probably not. But if I just dumped a bunch of money to restore something that I planned on using for the rest of my life, I would. Um, I would absolutely consider it just because for the price, it's not expensive at all. I mean, I'll double check the price right now, actually. But for the um, $7 that Todd is charging, uh, it is my personal opinion that I would I would just buy one for $7. Or, or maybe if Todd eventually releases the design um, print your own or something like that. But I don't know. It's just weird to me. Did, did both of the, um, controller manufacturers each do extensive weight and pressure testing to make sure that you could have the exact amount of pressure that's given from the weight of the memory card and this receiver, or did they kind of just go, yeah, it seems fine. The other company did it. So we'll do it too. I don't know. Um, and I'm not pointing fingers or anything. I'm just kind of saying, if you're worried about your N64, maybe grab one of these just in case. Humble Bazooka is now selling their version of the Atari JagLink adapter that they're calling the JagNet. And this is an adapter that plugs into the back of the Jaguar that allows you to connect multiple Jaguars together with a phone cable. So not an Ethernet cable, but a phone jack cable. And Unfortunately, only three games are compatible with it, and one of them, Doom, has some serious bugs when you try to use it. So this is really something that you would want to purchase uh, if you're a Jaguar collector and you just want everything out there, or if you're really hoping that maybe the homebrew scene will embrace it and add some more support for different games. Uh, the game Battlesphere and Air Cars both support it. Air Cars supports up to eight Jaguars linked together and Battlesphere up to 16, which is kind of nuts. I imagine they would probably do that uh, at an expo at some point just to demo it just for fun. But, you know, overall, this isn't something that I would recommend every Jaguar owner run out and get because there's a good chance that you might not ever be able to use it. But I do really hope that the homebrew community embraces stuff like this. And if it's not too crazy, maybe add support for this in their homebrew works. I know there was a game not outrun being worked on, which would be really neat if there was two player support there. Of course, that would probably be a tremendous amount of effort. So I'm just kind of daydreaming. I'm not expecting the developer to actually do that. But overall, it looks great. It's got a nice 3D printed shell. Uh, there's also something called a Jaglink 2, which is available from the Atari Age store that as far as I know is functionally perfect and totally safe to use, but it doesn't have a fancy 3d printed case it's just got a basic it looks like heat shrink tubing covering it which functionally that's totally fine as long as no traces are exposed but i wanted to talk about this one because it looks cool and because i definitely know a bunch of people that need every accessory available for the atari jaguar just because they want to know they have it there's nothing wrong with that and the price is fair so uh, if you're a jaguar collector and you want to buy something that may never get used give this one a shot 
A new version of the USB to DB15 adapter has just been released that's designed for people who want to consoleize their arcade boards. So the original adapter had USB input and DB15 output and was designed to be a general adapter for anybody who wanted to use a long list of USB controllers on your Neo Geo or your Super Gun or anything with a DB15 connector. And this version is pretty much the same thing, but instead of the DB15 connector, it has punch down terminals and just a standard pin socket header. So if you wanted to do something like consoleize an MV1C and include this in it so that there's two USB ports in the front, you could wire this directly on the inside to where the controller ports would go, um, to the pins on the, um, on the JAMA edge and all that stuff. It's basically just for people that want to build their own stuff like that from scratch. Or I guess if you want to build a fancier box that contains all of this stuff. But if you were going to do that, I think you'd probably buy the other one. But either way, choices are always great. I'm always happy to see choices. And other than the output connection, it's the same exact, very fast, very compatible adapter that I've talked about a few times. So if you want any more information on it, please check out Ronnie's post, as well as previous posts talking about this, um, which also explain how you could order them and what the pinout is and all of that other stuff. So very cool to see multiple choices for controller adapters, uh, just because... You know, it's been really hard for people in the fighting game community to get a lot of these. And while there's a bunch of great choices, um, I'm not really sure if one is necessarily better than the other. There might be different features added, but for straightforward, I just wanna plug my controller into an arcade board. Now we have a bunch of great choices and this seems to be one of them. Steve from RetroTech was recently a guest on Louis Cezarin's new podcast, which is linked to the Zez Retro channel that he's been putting videos up on, and this was a really fun one. Yeah, they talked about a lot of the nerdy stuff that you would expect, and a lot of origin stories, and, you know, all of the technical things that you would expect, but Steve also had a bunch of really, really funny stories about growing up that definitely made me laugh out loud and remember some of my own weird and nutty childhood. So if you wanted to laugh uh, and have hear some pretty cool stories, definitely recommend this one available as a video or just wherever you find podcasts. Uh, and just a note, this isn't Lewis's second podcast. Well, technically it is on this one. Uh, he's a comedian and been a podcaster for a long time and I was on his, he's been on mine and vice versa. So um, I know sometimes when people are first starting their podcast, and I mean this respectfully, but it's a little painful at first. You know, you got to get used to it. You got to get used to talking on mic. You got to get used to not umming, not tapping on the desk. Basically, all of the things that I did for like the first year that I had this podcast out. So don't worry, you're not getting into like a rookie podcast scenario in which I still like those two and I would still give those a chance, but you don't have any of that stuff to worry about here. Just easy, straightforward, very fun to listen to, uh, and two very cool people. So if you like listening to podcasts, or I guess watching because it's on a video as well, definitely give this one a listen. The Switch Online controllers that I talked about a few weeks ago were up for sale, and I think they're sold out, but they're supposed to be coming back in stock soon. Uh, but I'm going to talk about them anyway, so this way I don't have to re-talk about them when they come back in stock. But these were the controllers that I was speculating on before that are Bluetooth and are meant to be used only with the Nintendo Switch for use with their new Switch Online service, although I highly suspect that we'll be able to use these with other consoles and possibly even the Mr., I'm hoping. Um, and this is a Genesis 3-button control pad, which is one of my favorites. Uh, I know a lot of people disagree, but that's cool. It's all about preference. There isn't really a right and wrong. And there's also an, an original N64 style Bluetooth controller, which I think is the first time you could get the Trident style controllers. Actually, I actually have one right here because I've been working on a N64 related project, but it's basically the original controller, but Bluetooth instead of wired. And I purchased one of each just because I'm dying to test them. I'm sure I'll end up giving them away or something like that. But the total came to about 120 because I also had to purchase a one month Switch Online membership. You have to be a member in order to buy this. You don't have to be a member of their new service. You just have to be a member of the, you know, the cheapest, most basic one. So totally up to you if this is something that you're interested in. The only thing I will definitely say is maybe their website was just getting hammered, but I logged into my account, uh, you know, up uh, purchased the month refresh the controller page and it wouldn't let me buy them. It still acted as if I wasn't a Switch Online member. So I logged out, logged back in, same thing. Then I switched to a completely different browser and that worked. They were in stock and I was able to buy them. So 
I don't know if that's a weird thing with the Switch Online, if my browser cache was all messed up, but a few people mentioned that they had to do the same thing, and then afterwards a few people mentioned that they tried it and it was out of stock the whole time. And I never got the out of stock message, I always got add to wishlist, first add to cart, so I don't know. I don't know if that's relevant at all or if that problem will ever happen again, but I wanted to say it just in case you went to purchase one. I guess... There was a bit of a, a controversy over the price because they announced the expansion pack pricing and it was going to be an extra $30 per year. And the only perspective I had on that is an expansion pack cost more than the main membership and it's just not something I'd be interested in. You know, I, I'm lucky enough to be able to play these games on original consoles and through emulation if I wanted to as well. So I just, I don't think it's worth it for a laggy emulation service. But if you're a casual fan of the N64, you want to play some games from your childhood, and heck, you want to buy a new wireless controller, if the games that are available are the ones that you wanted to play, it does seem like a pretty decent deal. You know, it's it's like two bucks a month or something like that. So, you know, you got to just decide your own perspective if you think it's worth it for you or not. And I kind of just and kind of just ignore some of the back and forth cuz some people were kind of making it seem like it was this insane pricing like $30 a month and other people were saying like oh it's barely anything you won't even notice and it's like eh, I kind of feel like it's somewhere in between. I do try to listen to both sides of all arguments anyway, so maybe that's just why I'm I'm kind of thinking of it this way. It just did kind of strike me as odd that they would charge more for the expansion pack than they would for the original, but whatever. If you're into Genesis and N64 ROMs and don't have any other way to play them and want to play them on your Switch, then go for it. Maybe they're going to add some new features or something cool that would really apply to it. Uh, and I also believe that that Switch Online expansion pack includes a whole bunch of stuff about uh, with Animal Crossing, but I've never actually played that game, so I'm not the person to uh, to get that info from. Definitely check out one of the more modern gaming channels for that. My Life in Gaming just released a video that reviewed every single game compatible with the Super Scope light gun for the Super Nintendo, and I really enjoyed this video. Mark went through each of the games, their different modes, how they're different in controller mode versus Super Scope mode, and even a few games that had Super Scope support that many people might not have even realized it did. I certainly never knew that about Lemmings, or if I did, I totally forgot. And I never tried that mode in the racing game. And it was just really cool to watch Mark go through all of them. And some of the games he didn't like were the same ones that I didn't like, and really kind of turned me off from the whole Super Scope experience. I never had one as a kid, but I did buy one a few years ago. Back when my setup was a little weird, I had all my consoles here on my side, and then I had the display in front of me, and the IR receiver that the Super Scope uses has a cord that is super short, and it's not compatible with controller extension cords. So it was always a pain for me to set up and use it, and I never liked any of the games that I tried. So it was really cool to see Mark's perspective on some of the others, because it did make me want to kind of go back and try it again myself. There were a few other things about the video that were very small little snippets that I also enjoyed. Um, one of them was Mark briefly showing Wiimote support to use light guns through the mister. So it's not technically using it as a light gun, you're technically using the Wiimote as a mouse, but if you have any of those cheap plastic adapters that turn it into a zapper, or a, there's one that makes it like a menacer looking thing, um, I imagine that would be a really great experience. And I'm kind of mad at myself because I've had the tools to do this since the mister team first added the functionality, and I never got around to trying, which is very dumb because this is an awesome feature that I normally would love, especially because it's it's compatible with all TVs since you're not reading the TV at all you're just treating it as if it's a mouse and there is a cursor on screen but you could turn the cursor off if you want for more of an original you know uh, hope it lines up feel like some of the other zappers or the the light phaser uh, this, the ones that I have sometimes work and sometimes don't so you know if you want that feel you could do that too and it was only a brief little section, but I'm really glad that Mark mentioned it because Super Scope games are compatible with that on the Mister. And I also laughed out loud at Mark's little hyperkin joke. It was very unexpected coming from him. So overall, it was a really awesome video. I highly recommend it. And I also recommend that people check out the post that Mark wrote because it was very cool to see 
another different perspective. And you know, Mark kind of put in a few other things that maybe he cut out of the video and some of the other stuff that he had, uh, he had just kind of filtered through. And I love seeing this stuff. You know, if I like a video, I don't just want to watch the video. I like hearing the behind the scenes stuff and the creator's extra thoughts. And Mark really put some time into that in the post. So if you're even slightly interested in what the super scope might be like, I strongly recommend watching the video and even reading Mark's post to get some of the behind the scenes stuff about it. Ingo Korb, the creator of the GC video project, has just released firmware version 3.1 that includes some bug fixes and some changes that might affect people with playing games like Eternal Darkness, where there's a lot of screen blanking between the menu transitions. So I would definitely check out Alex's post and see if you're having any of these issues that the firmware had fixed. Uh, if you are, then you need to think about updating, which unfortunately could go two different paths. If your adapter is already on version 3.0 or higher, or you have a Prism adapter from Retrobit, updating should be fairly easy. You could use homebrew methods, or with, in the case of the Prism, you should be able to also just plug it into your computer via USB and update it that way. I don't have a Prism yet. Um, I, had, I borrowed one for a while, and I really should get one just for this exact reason but it should be fairly easy to update that. So it's kind of a no brainer. If you have the easy ability to update it, you might as well just do it. Now, if you have a GC video adapter that's on anything before the 3.0 firmware, you need to manually update it, which involves opening it up. And on some adapters that involves cutting it in order to open it up. And you might not want to go through all of that trouble. On top of that, it re requires an external programmer. So you have to wire everything in. Then you have to insert it into your GameCube because it needs to be powered while you're doing the update. It really is a pretty cumbersome process. So if you don't need any of the features that were in this update, maybe if you're not on version 3.0 already, just kind of hold off and see if anything else comes out. But, you know, if you were on the fence about it, like, oh, maybe I do want to upgrade, you know, maybe I would want to go through the trouble. Ingo mentioned one more feature coming. I have no idea what that feature is, but at least now if you go through the trouble, the next time there's an update, you could use one of the much easier methods to update the firmware. So any questions, please check out Alex's post on it because he had all the information lined up in there and all the links for everything you need to know. I recently had the opportunity to interview Tom Happ, the creator of the Axiom Verge games. And while this might sound pompous and arrogant and might annoy some people, I just got to say, holy shit, I got to interview Tom Happ, the creator of the Axiom Verge games. I couldn't possibly be any more excited to interview the creator of one of my favorite Metroidvania games, and certainly one of my favorite games that's come out on modern platforms. And I just, I loved both of the games. I really enjoyed talking to him. I was trying to contain my giddiness and excitement and slow down when I was talking because I really just wanted to fire a million questions at him. But I think the interview went very well and I think everything was pretty smooth and he was certainly really excellent to talk to. So um, if you are even slightly interested in the games, I would definitely give it a listen. If you wanted to play them, but you haven't played either yet, as much as I would love to see the view counts go up, I would say archive this, play at least one of the games, and then go back and kind of get some insight. But you don't, the cool thing about Axiom Verge 2 is you don't need to play one to really get it. Um, they are stories that tie into each other, but they are separate. So while I like personally playing games in chronological order, um, I think that this would be a perfect example of a time that that wouldn't really matter. So I would just play at least one of the games, get a feel of it. But if you've already played one and you're even slightly interested in it, please check this out because it was very exciting. I, I thought the interview went really well and it was so cool to hear directly from the creator. So thank you again to Tom Happ for doing this. And as always, thanks to everybody who listens. This is available as a video and everywhere audio podcasts are found. The audio views have been, or listens, I guess, have been a lot higher as with all of the other podcasts like this that I do. And that's totally cool. I just don't want people to click on the video and say, oh, hey, how come it doesn't have that many hits? It's because most people are listening to it in their cars or while they're walking. And as I always say, I genuinely don't care how you listen to it. I'm just very 
appreciative that you do, and I hope you're entertained by any of this stuff. So YouTube views are nice to see, but that's not what I care about at the end of the day. I care about introducing awesome people to the world, or in the case of Tom Happ, somebody that you probably have all heard of before, uh, but now I get to have my own conversation and ask a lot, some of the nerdier stuff that I definitely haven't heard and masked in other interviews before, as well as some of the normal stuff. So uh, if you're even slightly interested, please check it out, because I feel like this was a good one. Before I go, I just want to remind everybody once again that I will be doing a panel and we'll have a booth at the Retro World Expo November 6th and 7th, so just a few weeks from now, in Hartford, Connecticut. And the creators of the Retro World Expo have extended a discount code for anybody who wants to use it that will get you 15% off your ticket purchase from now until just October 21st is when the coupon code runs out. So I wanted to mention it one more time. Uh, I probably should have had the post up already, but I, I talked about it last week and everything else as well. So I tried to get the word out as best I could. Uh, and it was really nice of them to offer a discount code. I thought that was a very nice gesture. So I wanted to share it once again and hopefully get a chance to see a whole bunch of you at the expo. We will be at the table as much as we can, but we're also going to be doing our own panel at 6 p.m. in the main panel room A, and we're going to talk about basically just what's been going on in gaming. So on the retro side, although I'm sure we'll spill over into some of the newer retro style stuff that's been going on, but Beast is bringing a world of arcade knowledge. Uh, Destiny has all of her collector knowledge, which I message her all the time for collector -y questions so i'm glad to to have us all together in person just kind of picking each other's brains and then of course we're going to be doing a q a towards the end or maybe even the last half of it depending on how long i ramble for but uh i'm just really excited to do all that and especially the q a's because very often in these expos um, the q a's end up being the most fun and i end up learning something people in the crowd learn something it's always kind of funny too because it always takes people a minute to open up and ask a question and when they do it kind of the floodgates open and a really cool conversation always ends up starting so uh, if you were even close to the Hartford area and you want to see a great expo and hang out with people and kind of get back into the normal swing of things definitely consider going to this one I've been to every one of them and I think I've presented it all but one uh, it's just an awesome expo with a bunch of really great vendors uh, great guests this year too so definitely consider coming and I really hope to see as many of you as possible well, that's it for this time. As always, thanks so much to everybody who watches, listens, plays nicely in the comments, and especially thank you to anybody who supports on services like Patreon and Floatplane, because it's you who is keeping all of these podcasts, the tremendous amount of behind-the-scenes research, the website, and everything else going alive. So thank you all very much, and I will see you next week.